everybody. And uh, again, from me, apologies, I wasn't able to be there today. Um, I uh, was at the London event last week and uh, the lunch was terrific there as well. Um, as I as I I said last week, probably better than hospital food. I can say that safely this time because you can't you can't beat me up. You can't throw anything at me. Um, but this is actually a great example of the technology. So this is Microsoft Teams that I'm presenting to you on. And for those of you who are familiar with Skype for business, we hope that you will transition to Teams. The experience for video, multi-party video and audio is actually just uh, improves quite significantly from Skype for business. Uh, hopefully we won't have any interruptions to the broadband as we go through uh, the presentation today. Um, as ever with demos, you have to, to blame it on that. So I'm going to try and whistle through uh, quite a lot. I know you've had quite a lot of content already today, um, and this is a, a significant investment on behalf of NHS Digital. Um, and the next step, I guess, is how we help everybody deploy uh, the Windows 10 E5 licenses out to your organizations. So just by way of a, a little bit of background, I know the challenges that many of you face in terms of actually serving end customers. Uh, is the needs of the IT teams versus the needs of the users. And these can sometimes seem to be at odds with one another. Um, you know, the users are looking for simplicity, flexibility, and mobility. It's from your perspective in IT, it's very much around the manageability, security, and compliance. Um, and what we believe is by bringing together this kind of modern desktop, by which we're really referencing Windows 10 and Office Pro. Um, that we can actually merge these two together and make your lives much easier to deliver whilst improving things for users. So I fundamentally want to talk through the steps I think are involved in uh, doing a Windows 10 deployment and most importantly how to do that in a modern way. But it's always worth just sort of starting from a perspective of, you know, what are the benefits of Windows 10? Why do you want to do this? Um, and when I talk to customers, I kind of think about it in three ways. Um, firstly, it is better for the user. It really does help enhance their productivity and teamwork. Um, it's built for the cloud. It's easier to log in. You know, and customers are, you know, you, your users will be familiar with it. Um, you know, nearly three quarters, or probably over three quarters by now, of all end users were running Windows in a home environment and now running Windows 10. Um, so people are familiar with this already. And that's a, a, you know, we got, had great customer feedback. It's a fairly easy transition from seven because of the field. Um, and then critically, of course, it's better for the organization because the security of Windows 10 uh, is just that much better than everything that we had in Windows 7. Um, and unfortunately, the NSS is very aware of the challenges of not being secure. Um, you know, it was discovered summers ago, and that had quite a significant impact that we're all keen to avoid. And that's the main reason that NHS Digital team uh, in and, and provide the, uh, the Windows E5 licenses. Um, and you know, I know there's been some tremendous progress in rolling out the ATP, uh, even on Windows 7, to help with security. But the bit that's often forgotten is this idea of better for IT um, and how Windows 10 can be much easier to deploy and manage and to maintain going forward. And that's what I'll talk about. But it is just worth touching briefly on that security issue. Uh, I know you've already had a presentation of security, but I just wanted to highlight the differences between Windows 7 and Windows 10 from a security perspective. Keep in mind, that Windows 7 is 10 years old in the way that it was built and architected. You know, and frankly, there's no other 10-year-old technology that you have in your life. You know, probably your car, your phone, your video recorder, you know, maybe your microwave oven is 10 years old. But fundamentally, everything else has been replaced. And so given that this operating system is what our users use every day to do their job, and more importantly, is there to keep your system secure, why is it acceptable that this is the only 10-year-old piece of technology still left in use? And yeah, it really is time that we moved on. And this is the level of security that Windows 7 natively is able to provide as you think about all those different areas of security that you have to think about from identity protection to post breach uh, investigation and response. And so I'm sure that many of you are having to go out and license third party software uh, to fill these gaps. Yeah, and that not only costs you money in licensing third party products that you now don't need because you've got Windows 10 E5, um, but also is complex to integrate, to manage, uh, and all those different elements to, to keep updated. You know, keep in mind, when we're talking about Windows, we're talking about security that is built in, not bolt on. Uh, we know from data that a lot of the blue screens happening because of the unsupported APIs that many security vendors need to use. Uh, in order to keep, uh, you know, to deliver their, their security capability. So if you take a Windows 7 device, uh, let's call it an old legacy device, and run Windows 10 on it, you will then get 
these incremental features in terms of security. So we really start to plug a lot of the security gaps already. And then more importantly, if you run that on a modern device, one that supports PPID chips and, uh, you know, and virtualization technology, um, then you really step up the level of security capability built in. You know, Microsoft is now spending over a billion dollars a year on security R&D alone. You know, so the R&D budget is in many cases bigger than the sort of revenues of some of the security companies we compete with. You know, and I say that not you know, just because obviously we'd like to use our stack, because genuinely this has already been paid for. This is built into Windows. Um, and so you may as well take advantage of that. Now, I know if I'd stood here or uh, sat here uh, some years ago and suggested you don't need third party AV, you could use Windows Defender. I'd have been probably quite rightly laughed out of town. But we've made significant progress since then, and there are now analysts who will quite comfortably stand behind us as being you know, as good or better than anything else on the market. And that's true for a lot of our security capabilities. So enough on security. Let's go on to what I really want to talk about, which is this idea of how do we help you in IT deliver a more modern IT to manage and maintain your infrastructure. And when we think about modern IT, obviously, you know, in a more modern world, there's a lot more devices out there. There's a lot more automation. We have a savvier user base who are maybe more capable of doing a lot more self-service. And obviously, we've got a cloud integrate. The basis of what we're trying to do is to really make it simpler, more secure, uh, to lower the cost of, uh, of ownership and, and critically to improve the experience for users. But there's a lot involved in transitioning to modern IT. Um, this I call my kind of weather forecaster slide because typically we are somewhere down at the bottom today and most users, uh, most organizations are still doing imaging to deploy new machines. Uh, you know, they're using group policy and active directory to manage the system and to provide the security and access control. Um, you know, and things like roaming profiles, which I know many in IT would you know, wish we'd never invented at Microsoft or Bain in many people's lives. Um, and what we want to do is to help people transition to the top, which is a really cloud way of managing. And this isn't just about deployment and management, but it's thinking everything through in terms of how you do security and identity, where data is stored, and even how support can be improved by using cloud technology. So how do we move from group to Intune or MDM capabilities to you know, secure a system? And how do we start storing data in you know, OneDrive for Business and logging on and doing identity with Azure Active Directory? So this is, I guess, the long-term journey that we envisage IT departments going on in order to simplify. We do recognize this isn't a case of stop doing what you're doing today, throw it all out and start again. Um, this is going to be a journey and a transition to move, if you like, from the bottom to the top. And so we have that capability with co-management. So you can both enroll into a domain and an Azure AD. You can manage both with SCCM and with Intune. And we're sure that's going to be the way for some time to come as people make that transition. And a lot of the Windows 10 journey is obviously around Windows as a service. Um, so I just wanted to take a minute to make sure that everybody's clear on what we mean. Um, but fundamentally, this is about a new way in which we build, we deploy, and we service Windows. Uh, I'm sure you're all uh, you know, acutely aware of the twice annual updates um, we introduce typically in the spring and the summer, uh, sorry, spring and autumn, um, and also you know, how we update uh, differently to how we did in Windows 7. So again, just for clarity, let's look at there are only two different types of updates that we provide as part of Windows going forward. We have quality updates, which are cumulative and available monthly. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with things like Pack Tuesdays, um, you know, that introduces the security and reliability fixes, etc. Now, the difference with Windows 10 is that this is only these are cumulative. So when you deploy the latest one, it will bring you fully up to speed. Um, you know, rather than in previous uh, Windows 7, you can choose which fix you want. Um, and I'm sure most of you basically took the approach of if it says critical, I'll install it, otherwise why bother? Um, what that means, of course, is that, you know, we can't determine exactly what iteration of Windows you're running dependent on which fixes and which bug, you know, uh, which knowledge base installs you've done. And that makes it very hard when it comes to debugging and, and fixing issues to know, you know, because effectively you've all got a slightly different flavor of Windows 7. But with the idea of cumulative updates, we can guarantee that everybody is always fully patched, always secure and, and up to date with the same version of the developer. And then we have feature updates. Feature updates come twice per year. They do introduce new capabilities. Now, you don't have to automatically use to deploy all those capabilities. Um, you know, and, 
you, you can choose when these things get deployed, and I'll touch on that. At the moment. But you know, the question sometimes gets asked, well, why are we doing that? Uh, and if you think about the way that Windows is run today, you this idea of kind of three to five year update. What happens is over time, we have a gap between the sophistication of what the bad actors are doing and how they're able to attack our system and when Windows will get properly updated at sort of architectural level. And so by updating every six months, we shorten that time frame quite significantly and we're able to keep the system much more secure, as well as, of course, introducing new features at a faster rate, which is what users expect in this kind of mobile world. So what does this look like in terms of a time frame? Um, you know, this is a layout of, of the historical versions and looking a little bit further forward as well. Uh, and it shows you how long sort of releases last and how they overlap. So the key thing, even in this, this iteration with an 18-month time frame, you can see that it is feasible to skip update. Um, so if you choose, you could only deploy sort of once every year to an individual user. And actually, as organizations get larger, we are starting to see typically there'll be two in use at any one time um, with an individual machine, sometimes hopscotching a release. Uh, so they'll only get an update once a year per machine. It's important to flag here as well that you get access to the code to test six months prior to the release using the insider build. And hopefully many of you, if not personally, you know, maybe personally are on the insider program. But we would certainly suggest that somewhere in the lab within IT, uh, you do download those insider builds and start to test uh, early. Now, we have recently announced some changes to this where we will be extending uh, an additional 12-month support for enterprise customers. And obviously, you are all now licensed for Windows Enterprise. Um, we backdated that to help people catch up. And then going forward, our uh, autumn release, so the 09 releases typically will be 30 months of support, with the March release being the, the current 18. But that's not that we suggest that anybody uh, specifically goes for one or the other. Uh, they will both continue to be built at the same speed with the same uh, benefit. Uh, this is simply we have seen through our data that more customers in the enterprise world tend to be installing in that uh, September timeframe. And so that's the one they would prefer we have additional support uh, on. <laughs> what we call the semi-annual channel and the, the number of releases um, you are in control of when these get pushed out um, you know and we need and certainly part of the transition to modern IT is to think about how you manage groups of users how you create pilots so that you can test before pushing out broadly and then using whichever management tool you work with uh, in order to manage that and, and how and where it gets rolled out so if you compare to how things have been done previously Typically, when developing a new version of Windows to push out, um, this is the way things work. So there was a huge amount of work that went on pre-deployment. Uh, effectively, you know, you've got the OS ready. You did all the app and pat, literally of testing every single application. And you've got your drivers ready and so on and so forth. And then at some point, having done all of that work, you make a, no, a sort of go, no-go decision that says we're now ready to deploy. And then having done that, you lock the image down. And you then uh, keep that with as limited change as possible for as long as possible, and then deploy and use that up to the end of life. And you know, we typically saw quite extended time period and huge investment uh, in you know, time and money before you got to that deploy uh, decision. And what we need to do in this new world of kind of more frequent releases is to help you bring that time frame right in, so that you can make the go no go decision. Uh, much more readily. You can do that if you like at multiple iterations at a time as you're going through those different versions of Windows. And therefore, you can deploy and use for you know a longer period. And so to do that, we need to give you new tools because this is absolutely a paradigm shift. You know, for those of you who like me have been in this game, you know, for upwards of 20 years, uh, it's important that you know we forget the ways to some extent that we have built and deployed today and we start using these new capabilities by putting, frankly, big data and analytics at the heart of the way we manage our systems. You know, we're all out there engaging with our users who are asking us for digital transformation, they're asking for AI, for big data, and yet we don't look at how we can use those same tools within the IT team in order to help manage and deploy the systems better. So this means using a telemetry-based approach, switching, if you like, what we call green button to red button. So currently, many people do a test everything, when we're satisfied, we've tested everything, we'll press the green button and we'll start deploying. 
And what we mean by moving to red button is test the essentials, understand what is essential, do a pilot, and then start deploying, ready to hit the red button should you hit any issues to stop deployment and, if necessary, you know, roll things back. So we're not saying don't test. We're saying we need to take a risk management approach to testing, and we need to use data to significantly shorten the amount of test time that we have. And then when it comes to deploying, again, we need to start doing a lot more automation. So the use of MDM tools, of FCCM, um, you know, and we have to, as Microsoft, be better at helping to improve those downloads and you know, optimize the downloads and the install time as well. And there have been already significant improvements in each version of Windows as we do that. So I'm sure many of you are sitting there saying, well, this is all well and good, but we have a lot of challenges in the NHS. You know, we've got to make sure, you know, we are literally have people's lives at risk. Uh, we have to be compliant, et cetera. So you know, how do we do that in the real world? This simply can't be done. Well, I just wanted to sort of give you an example of the fact that actually we do this at Microsoft today. Uh, we act as the IT department for over 700 million users, and we keep their machines up to date. And we do that using exactly the same principles, processes, and technologies that we're advocating that organizations do now. You know, now this 700 million users are people who are using Windows Update to deploy their systems. That's obviously the most part consumers, but in a significant case, that's businesses, small and medium as well. You know, we're literally they're outsourcing the IT management to us. You know, and if you think about that, we were able to deploy Windows 1803 on top of previous versions of Windows to 250 million users in 49 days. Now, you can only do that when you're sure that when you push an update, it's going to work. And you can only be sure of that if you've got significant amount of data that you're taking advantage. So we knew, for example, as we released 1709, there were a good 55 million machines out there for whom 1709 was not going to work day one. They had incompatible drivers, etc. And so we simply were never going to push the bits to those users because our data was telling us they were not going to have a good experience. We then go work with the necessary partners and vendors to fix those driver issues, et cetera, and then we push it out uh, when we know they're ready. So the way that we do this is, first of all, we significantly increase the compatibility from version to version to version. You know, we are uh, public in stating that we will, um, as, as long as people write applications to the published APIs for Windows, then things will not break from version to version. And then most critically, we use data um, the new technology effectively is already in Windows um, to understand you know, and help us prioritize app testing, to mitigate issues, uh, to work with partners, and then, as I say, only upgrade what we know the experience is a good one. So if we look at what's involved in this phases of delivering a Windows 10 project, um, these are the things that you will need to sort of, the, the, the work uh, streams that you will need to think about. Um, it is essential to have infrastructure um, in place. And I know that uh, Peter from NHS Digital talks about this quite a lot. Um, you know, many people are using SCCM. Uh, you'll hear later, hopefully, from Power On, who have an ability to deploy SCCM in the cloud very quickly. Um, but you can use other management tools, certainly uh, MDM tools, be it Intune or others as well. Um, but you need to get that infrastructure ready in order to help facilitate these ongoing deployments. Now, you need to create inverted commas of build. Um, we don't mean that necessarily in a gold image in the traditional way that would be pushed out, um, but this can be simply the collection of GPOs or MDM policies that will be required to keep your organization safe, secure, and managed. We do have tools like MMAP that you can run on a machine today, and it will tell you this is available on GitHub. It will tell you all of the GPOs on that machine, and it will translate for you and show you the applicable MDM policy or highlight to you when there isn't one. And then you need to get ready to push those out. Now, this is a service that um, uh, Microsoft Services, Bytes, and NHS Digital are working to do to provide you with that baseline build already. So we can provide you with a security baseline that's been approved by both NHS Digital and by the NCSC, uh, you know, Cyber Criminal Center as well, uh, Cyber Security Center as well. Now, there is a level of app compact testing that will need to be done. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute, how you can use analytics to significantly reduce the time. It's worth keeping in mind, of course, that probably about half of the trusts in the NHS have already made a significant move to Windows 10. And therefore, we know that the majority of applications in use across the NHS will work on Windows 10. And in fact, this is a significant change from many of you who have been through a Windows migration before. For those of you who remember the XP to 7 migration, 
Uh, I'm sure I'll see plenty of nods in the room at this stage. Um, you know, this that was painful. We broke a lot of APIs and a lot of you know apps had to be rewritten. We haven't done that this time. And we are very comfortable to state that uh, for commercial ISV applications, uh, over 99% of what works on Windows 7 will work on Windows 10. Um, so we are that confident. Now, clearly, we can't comment on line of business applications that you may have written internally or running internally. Um, but typically, we do see this through data when customers engage. If it works on 7, it works on 10. And to that end, we actually have introduced an offer that I'll talk about shortly um, that states as such. Uh, it's called Desktop App Assure, and if you bring us an application that was working on 7, uh, but you can't get working on 10, then our engineers will get that working for you free of charge. Then obviously you need to deploy, um, and again, uh, in some situations, certainly if you're moving from 32-bit, uh, that may involve the traditional wipe and load. More and more we want to see this done as an in-place upgrade, again, I've got to touch on deployment in a while. And then having done that, there is this whole issue you've got to keep in mind around having moved from 7 to 10, so getting current, you then need to stay current. And that means, again, using these tools to help you understand when you can move, when your users are ready, and when you can push the bits out. So at the heart of all of this... Rob, I I'm just going gonna, gonna, gonna to stop you if I may, because we've reached our time, So, and I just want to make sure that the audience have got the opportunity to ask you some questions as well. Okay, so I do want to just cover the next couple of slides because they're absolutely... Is that okay, guys? Yeah. Thank you. Really. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, so Windows Analytics is a free service you can deploy today from the Azure cloud. Um, so you can literally switch this thing on. Um, it requires no additional agents deployed to the machine. All you have to do is run a minor script that simply points a device at your tenant. And then after a brief period of time, you know, give it a week or so gathering data, analytics will give you a dashboard that tells you everything that's going on on your network. It will tell you how many devices you have and their compatibility with Windows 10 at the hardware level and at the driver level. It will tell you if we find incompatible drivers that we already know that there are replacements available on Windows Update, upgrade you as needed. Critically, we will also give you information on all the applications on your network. And we will tell you where we have seen that application before, whether or not it's compatible with Windows 10, according to the statement from the vendor. But also, if we, even if we haven't got a statement from the ISV, um, if we have seen that application running without causing any crashes on literally tens to hundreds of thousands of devices, we'll tell you that as well. Critically, <coughs> we'll tell you how much each of these applications is in use and by whom. I often hear from users, yeah, but I've got this one application, everybody uses it all the time, it doesn't work with Windows, so I can't migrate. Actually, when you get the data, you actually start to realize that it's typically a much smaller group of users and maybe they use it infrequently. And for that, we would say, fine, let's go solve for that app issue and we'll help you do that. But in the meantime, don't let that stop you from deploying everything else as well. So analytics is key. Um, you need to go get this run, it's completely free, it will tell you what's on your network, it will tell you about the apps and their compatibility. And then critically, once you have this running, you can keep using this as you want to do your updates. And it will tell you about your level of compatibility with all the future updates as well. And as we roll out new capabilities here, it will start to group all those users together for you. It will give you all the machine names, so you can literally then import that into your management tool and start creating groups to upgrade. We have the same available for Office, it's called the Office Readiness Toolkit, and that will tell you all about your compatibility uh, for um, Office add-ins and macros as well, should you want to move to Office Pro Plus. So fundamentally, use analytics to do an inventory of what you have. Validate that using the analytics tools. You can actually just go to readyforwindows.com and do a search on any ISV software, and it will tell you whether it's compatible. And then should you hit issues when you try and move to Windows 10, but you have an app that works on 7, you can visit this link uh, for the desktop app Assure and give us that application and we will get it working for you. So I've covered briefly what desktop app Assure is as well. Um, we haven't probably got the time to talk about deployment. Needless to say that we think it's about doing in-place upgrades. So you're going over the top of what's there today. That means you keep the individual machines you know, um, settings, applications, data, much slicker and quicker experience for users as well. So in summary, you need to use analytics to get insight. 
into what's on your network and the applications and their compatibility. You need to get your infrastructure ready and then move, you know, hopefully with an in-place upgrade to Windows 10. Once you've done that, keep in mind a Windows 10 um, program is a process, not a project. It's ongoing because you need to figure out how to stay current. Yeah, and with the January 2020 date looming for end of support of Windows 7, it is important to start now uh, and get to as much as you can. Think about that 80-20 rule where probably 20% of your apps might not be compatible and <laughs> everything else will get you to probably 80% of your users. So to help, <laughs> we do have an offer that Bytes and their partners will be able to deliver, um, which is a modern desktop assessment. Uh, this is where a Microsoft partner will come and work with you to deploy analytics and bring you back a report to show you exactly what's going on on your network. Now, we will cover the cost of doing this. Uh, it's probably two to three days' work for the partner. And Microsoft will pick up the tab, um, so you can work with Bytes on finding a partner to do that. The beauty of this, if you start doing this now, is I know that many people are saying we haven't got budgets to do all of this out migration work. But, of course, with a new fiscal year, given that there is no cost to deploy analytics at all, and we will even come and do this assessment and get it in place for you, that gives you the data to understand how big a project this is, how many issues you will have, and therefore to effectively get a very accurate budget request in for the new fiscal year. And it'll also allow you to start doing the testing on those applications that you don't know are compatible uh, in time to really hit the ground running in the new year and get deployed. And that's me. So any questions for Rob? And apologies, we've run over a little bit. Yeah. Any questions for Rob? Um, yeah, I've got one. The future of ECC and Intune, uh, they seem to be battling it out inside Microsoft for deploys. Where's the future line? OK, did you get that, Rob? Was that future between FCCM and Intune? Yes. Yeah, so the honest answer is we do see them both being around for quite some time still. Um, you know, so we are continuing to make investments in SCCM. We understand that there is a level of granularity of control that you get from SCCM that you might not do from Intune. Long term, we think things will be in the cloud, um, but that's why we have this co-management capability. You can manage between SCCM and Intune. Got two questions. Great, thank you. Anybody? Any more questions? I guess these slides will be available. Yes, they will do. Yeah. They will be available. <clears throat> all right, so I'll just say thank you very much indeed, Rob. Um, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> thank you for putting up with me being remote. I hope it worked all right for you. And uh, luckily, the technology held up. Yeah, it did. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Thanks a lot now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> right, we're just going to do a quick swap. Yeah.